So we're doing a series in the book of Ruth, and today we're in chapter 3. And as I've been reading this chapter, this past week or two, it's become a laugh to me. Because I think chapter 3 is one of the greatest pictures of the local church in the whole Bible. Chapter 3 is an incredible picture of the church. And the Jesus church is the only solution that God has to this world's problems. There's no other plan that God has on the face of the earth other than the local church of Christ. And, and friends, the less we make it about ourselves, and the more we put the focus on Jesus, the more God can use the church to help people get onto the straight road. And the problem is that I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, and people get hurt in the church. I was speaking to a lady this morning, sharing about how people get disappointed in the church. People get misunderstood in the church. And often people get offended. But God's plan is still, for us as the bride of Christ, still the local church. And there are pictures all over the Bible to show us as a church more of what Jesus is like. And Ruth, this story in the Bible, Ruth is just one of them. So let's read it together. It's been special to see Kelly just pray for us and ask God to speak to us through his word this morning as we read. Chapter 3, verse 1. One day Naomi, her mother-in-law, just pause there. This is a great picture if you are a mother-in-law. Can I just see this morning, church, who, who's a mother-in-law here? Just put up your hand. You, know, you, you ladies here, you mother-in-laws are special because you know why? Naomi, she, she, she's, a, she's a horrible mother-in-law. You are special mother-in-laws. She, she was bitter. And, and so there's often jokes about mother-in-laws. And I just feel today that we need to honor you as mother-in-laws for the role you play in our lives. Can we honor them, church? Amen. And for my mate's mother-in-law, she's not here today. I'll tell you what, she's also a horrible mother-in-law. And so if you're sitting there wishing that your mother-in-law would change, maybe send her the podcast of this message because there was, there's hope. Naomi changed. She was bitter, but now she's changed. And so this scripture gives me faith knowing that my friend's mother-in-law can change too. One day, we read on, one day Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you? Just go back to chapter 1 and verse 20. Have a look and see what it says there. Read with me. It says, Don't call me Naomi, she said. Call me Mara. Say Mara. Mara means bitter. Call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. So she's very bitter, but one chapter later, we read now in chapter 3, she's saying, should I not try and find a home for you? You know, one of the greatest ways that you know people are following Jesus is when they take their focus off of themselves and they put the focus on other people. Michelle and I met with a lady on Friday morning. She shared with us how her and her husband had been in in a high school youth ministry for years and and how things didn't work out in her marriage how she got divorced and how through the pain and the challenges that she went through she still today finds herself being involved in high school kids and in their lives and she says when I look at them and I think about them in their spiritual lives I just start to weep how she's taken the focus off of herself and the pain of a divorce focusing on these high school kids and now Omi friend she's bitter her life has been destroyed She's been through a really tough time. Her and her husband have probably gone bankrupt. They left Bethlehem in a financial crisis. And some of you sitting here today are going through a financial crisis right now. She's moved from Bethlehem to Moab. You know how far that is? 3,321 kilometers. It's not like moving from Benoni to Pretoria. Hey, Chris, there's no bit of transport in, in those days. You know, moving is stressful. Eh? Moving is emotional. Because we, we hoarders. If you're a hoarder like myself, you hoard on two bicycles, you hoard wheels, you hoard all this stuff. You inherit a pot from your uncle who's just passed away. And you think, now, should I, should I keep this pot? 
so much stuff. It's incredibly emotional. And so she's gone through this economic crisis. She's packed up her stuff. Some of the stuff's probably broken along the way in the move. And she's moved all this way. She arrives now in Moab. And she has to learn a, a new foreign culture. It's not easy learning a foreign culture, friends. And it's easy to become self-absorbed when you're going through a culture change. Would you agree? And then she loses her husband in Moab. And there are ladies sitting here today who've lost their husbands years ago. And they're trying to live meaningful lives with purpose. Trying to find something to live for. Maybe planning a holiday. Maybe living for their grandkids. But it's very painful. And on top of that, she's lost her sons. It's very painful when you lose people. And she's done the whole lot. She's gone through this economic crisis. She's moved places. She's learned a new culture. She's lost her husband. And now her two sons. And on top of this, her two daughter-in-laws. They haven't been able to fall pregnant in 10 years. Even that, friends. Think of it. There's people sitting here in this hall who haven't been able to have their own kids. And there's a deep pain in people's hearts. And then Naomi goes back again. She moves from Bethlehem to Moab. Then she moves back to Bethlehem. And she comes back bitter. But one chapter later, she's taken the focus off of herself. And she's put it onto somebody else. That's when the gospel takes hold of our lives, friends. Because Jesus left his home. He came down here to earth. He left his father around the throne. And he came here to engage with people who needed healing. Amen. My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you? I for you. Say that. I for you. Ak for you. Turn to the person next to you and say, I for you. No, no, no. Freedom Church, work with me here. Because I don't think we realize how selfish our culture is. But not only is a selfish city. We live for me, myself, and I. That's the culture of Benoni. And we've got to learn to open our eyes to other people because that's how the gospel comes. If I carry on living for me, myself, and I, we will not become a solution to anything. Say that again, I for you. I for you. When I do something for you, that's when the church starts to operate. When I do something for you, where there's no ulterior motive, yeah, no hidden agenda, carry on reading should i not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for now boaz with whose woman you have worked is a kinsman of ours tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor my brother last week taught us how to google and so i googled winnowing winnowing is a process of removing the unwanted husk from the grains and I think it might have been something like this. Maybe a festival where they winnow the, the grain from the husk. Maybe like that cherry picking festival outside Clarence. What's that little town? Is it Fixburg? Something like that. Maybe some of you have been there. Bit of a festival. And so she says to Ruth. She says, Ruth, wash. Put on perfume. That Narcissio Rodriguez perfume. That's a lacquer one, eh, ladies? And get dressed in your best clothes, Ruth. Friends, if you want to have a date, there's some very simple things that you need to do. Have a shower. Put it on deodorant. I want to say to the guys here, look good, man. Feel good. Be confident, not cocky. There's a massive difference, not arrogant. There's a lady joined us this morning at church all the way from Four Ways. Her name is Juliet. And she's looking for a Romeo. Are you going to treat her like a daughter of God, friends? Treat her way differently to the way the wolves treat her. Take her out, spoil her. Give her respect, man. Then go down to the threshing floor, she says. But don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and he will tell you what to do. Sure. She's clean, she's perfumed, she's trying to find a husband. 
And Naomi says, he will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down on the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. I can imagine a middle-aged guy with a bit of a a love handle starting around his waist. He's had a couple of drinks. He's had a lacquered chow. And they say when you hit your 40s, you don't, you stop, you start snoring, eh? Now for me, I don't know if I snore. I don't think I do. But you can imagine this this man snoring in the corner. Startled. When I get startled, I sort of go into a cowering position. Ah, 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 ah. Startled, he asked, who are you? I'm your servant, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a kinsman redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that you showed me earlier. You have not rung after the younger men whether rich or poor, and now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem good, let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. I will redeem you. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He said to her, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured it into six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, How did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her. I want to say to the young people sitting here today, You know a rule of law? You want to know? When you go out for a night out on the town, don't do anything that you're not prepared to tell your mother-in-law or your mother in the morning. Yeah? Don't do anything you're not prepared to tell your mother. In the morning. And for us as parents, we bring up our kids in the way of the Lord. We teach them about the Bible. Naomi's pointing her daughter in law into a direction, friends. It's not an arranged marriage. She's just pointing her into a direction. I want to say to the moms and dads here what type of direction are you pointing your kids into? It's like I can bring up my kids, I can teach them how to read, teach them how to write, send them to school, teach them how to drive. I can teach them how to apply for their passports. And then I can just send them off to some nightclub and they can come back the next day and say, hey, mom and dad, this is the guy that I want to marry. Can't be like that, friends. It's got to be an interaction. It's got to be an action thing. It's got to be a a family thing, man. It's a process bringing up your kids. I can remember sitting on my parents' bed one Saturday morning and them sharing with me about how they felt about my blonde girlfriend, just asking me some questions. I think my folks took a page out of Andy Stanley's book. He's a pastor in America and he says this. He says, moms and dads, for your kids between the age of naught to five, you need to discipline them. And the Bible says that disciplining involves the rod. Moms and dads, don't spare the rod. Between the age of five, naught and five. And then between the age of five and 12, he says that's a process where you start training your kids. And then when they, between the age of 12 and 18, you start coaching them. You start asking them questions. What's it going to look like if you spend time with, with those friends? What's it going to look like if you go to those places on a Saturday night? What's, the, what's some of the consequences going to be? And he says when they, between the age of 18 onwards... He says, then you're friends with your kids. And he says, if you miss that gap between the age of naught to five and you don't discipline them, all the other stages are not going to fall into place. 
Let's carry on reading. She says to her mother-in-law, Mother-in-law Naomi, he gave me these six measures of barley. Saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. And then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Say today. The matter is settled today. This is my prayer, friends, that we settle some matters today. Today, we settle some matters. Amen? This is an incredible picture, friends. Naomi is looking out for Ruth. Ruth is looking out for Naomi. That's why she's not going for some young guy with a perfect body and and a six pack. She could have. But she's looking at a whole package about how she can be looked after. About how God can be glorified and how her mother-in-law can be looked after. And Boaz, he's looking out for both of them. Because every time she leaves Boaz, she leaves with a bucket full of stuff. She never leaves empty-handed. And so in the life of the church, when we've got people looking out for each other, every time we leave each other's presence, we should leave here with something in our hearts. Every time I rub shoulders with Chris, I should leave with something in my heart. That's when the church of Christ becomes a solution to the world's problems, friends. And so there's three quick things that I want us to chat about today. And then we've done three things. You're going to have to listen to the scriptures and maybe read them later when you get home. Naomi says this to Ruth. She says, can I not find a husband for you? This is the bitter woman. The bitter mother-in-law. I want to speak to us today, myself included, about bitterness this morning. And you're sitting there saying, oh, Daryl, that's not me. I'm going to switch off. I should have stayed at home today. And live streamed the Argus on my TV. I want to say this to you friends. Bitterness cannot be treated. Bitterness cannot be managed. The Bible says that bitterness is a root. It's a root. Share a story about a tree in my garden. I cut the branch of this tree. Because the rats were climbing up this branch. And they were getting into my roof. My life. And so I cut it. And on Wednesday evening, I'm sitting with my daughter and I see the shadows again from the banana leaves going onto this branch. Daddy rat and his six little kids coming to doo-doo in my roof. And so we wet them with a hose pipe. And I looked at this branch thinking, just six weeks ago, I cut this branch and now it's grown again. That root of that branch has grown. Bitterness, friends, is a root. You cannot manage bitterness And there are bitter people in this hall. I want to tell you, on this August weekend today, we're going to settle the matter today. Today, friends. What causes bitterness? Three things. Number one, bitterness is caused by hardship. Hardship causes bitterness. Naomi is a casing point. I've lost my husband. I've lost my sons. I've lost my job. I'm so bitter inside of my heart. Are you bitter, sir? Is there bitterness inside of your heart, ma'am? Because life is tough. I know some of your stories. Some of you have got to do everything for yourself. You don't have a husband to help you. He's left. He's gone. It's not easy. And, And you've been through things that should never have happened to you and it's tough. Have you become bitter? Some of you are losing businesses and jobs right now. And I'm not standing preaching at you. My heart cries with you. But bitterness is caused by hardships. The second thing that causes bitterness is people. And we don't have time to look at this. But there's a story in 1 Samuel chapter 1 about a lady named Hannah. And she cannot fall pregnant. She cannot have kids. And in those days children were a very big social status. If you didn't have children, if you were barren, barrenness was scorned. And it says this, it says, her rivals provoked her. See friends, whenever you sit in a city like Benoni, in our city, Benoni, we've got a set of social values that are very important. One of these is success and the other one is finances. And so we put success and we put finances as idols in our lives. And people mock us, people provoke us because of what we have. 
Because we're already don't have. And if you're not guarded, bitterness is going to creep into your heart. Because you don't have what the person next door has. Let me be vulnerable with you. I sat in a businessman's office the other day just chatting about life. And as I was going, he started sharing with me about a holiday. Another holiday that he was planning. And I got into my car and I closed the door. And before I started my car, yo, I just had to check my heart. Bitterness. Bitterness creeps in because of what people have and what people don't have. We know this because Hannah was mocked because she couldn't have kids. And she cries out, the bitter inside of my spirit. And there are people in this hall who can't have children. Has bitterness, I want to ask you, has bitterness crept in your heart? Some of you have failed in your businesses. Has has bitterness crept into your heart? If you're not guarded, bitterness will creep into your heart. Number one, bitterness is caused by hardships. Number two, bitterness is caused by people. And the third reason we have bitterness is because we have what I call self-righteousness. We think that we God. You see, the best way to describe bitterness and worry, worry is when we don't think that God will get it right. Bitterness is when we think God's got it wrong. Let me say that again. Worry is when we don't think God will get it right. Bitterness is when we think God has got it wrong. And so I can toss and turn at two in the morning when the rats keep me awake at night and I can start to worry. I can start to worry about the future of my kids. I can start to worry about the future of Freedom Church and what God's got planned. Bitterness is when I'm in a situation and I I think God's got it wrong. And so when we take the place of God and think, well, if I was God, I would be married by now. If I was God, I would be pregnant by now. If I was God, I would have given myself that promotion in my department by now. No, friends, this story is here to remind us that God is still sovereign and God is still in charge. And we as a community and a family here at Freedom, we fight for each other that we won't become bitter. And we pray that people in Benoni won't become bitter. That somehow in the midst of things that you're going through, that you'll accept that God is in control. We don't have the answers. Pain is a mystery, friends. Death is a mystery. But when we take the place of God, bitterness will creep into our hearts. Amen. That's what causes bitterness. Hardships, number one. People, number two. And self-righteousness. But how does bitterness affect us, friends? What effect does bitterness have on our lives? Number one, it says in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Be careful that the root of bitterness. Wees versichtig vir die wortel van bitterheid. Man, I love Afrikaans. It just rolls off your tongue. Wees versichtig vir die wortel van bitterheid. Be careful, friends, that that root of bitterness does not grow inside of you and defile many. Say defile many. You see, friends, when I become bitter with my wife, Michelle, And she's a beautiful lady, but she's not perfect. And this week I've shown her too that I'm not perfect. Because sometimes I'm not slow to anger. And I can't blame it on the rats that keep me awake in my roof. When I become bitter towards Michelle and that root grows inside of me, I will go and chat to her friend, Zoli, who's got no problem with Michelle. And I'll convince Zoli of my picture of Michelle and distort the way that she thinks of Michelle because of a root living inside of my heart. We don't have time to look there, but in Mark 6, there's a story of Herod who has taken his brother's wife and made his brother's wife his own wife, Herodias. He steals his brother's wife. John the Baptist gets to hear about this and he speaks out against this. And it says that Herodias... Herod's wife nursed a grudge against John the Baptist. 
The message translation says she was inflamed. She was enraged with anger. I love that picture. I can imagine fire from her blue eyeballs coming out. I can imagine billowing smoke coming out of her cute nostrils. She nursed a grudge. Herod actually likes John the Baptist. One translation says that John's words were sweet to Herod. But Herodias, his wife, she's nursing a grudge. And when I hear that nursing a grudge, I have a picture in my mind of nurses running around somebody in ICU. Renee's dad's been in ICU for some time now. And the nurses have been rallying around him, nursing him, looking after him, making sure he gets well. If there's a grudge lying in a bed in ICU, nurses will nurse that grudge. And when the blood pressure drops, they'll run and make sure that that grudge grows and becomes healthy. And that the blood pressure stabilizes in that grudge. They watch that grudge all the time. And that grudge that gets nursed causes Herod to kill John the Baptist because he listens to his wife instead of doing what God wanted him to do. A grudge, a bitterness defiles many. Naomi has come back to Bethlehem, her hometown, but she's come back bitter. And one chapter later, she's been healed. Friends, it's time to be healed. It's time to be healed. We hold bitterness against our bosses, against our parents, against pastors. It causes havoc in churches and in cities. Maybe you have a grudge against your neighbor. Settle the matter today. Amen. The second thing that bitterness causes, friends, is it causes us to become senseless. In Psalm 73, this is an incredible psalm. It basically says this, I'm serving God with everything inside of me. And my next door neighbor, who is an absolute so-and-so, a beep, 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 this guy's getting blessed and I'm going through a tough time. Paraphrase. It's like he's living a godless life. He goes out on Friday nights, goes with his mates to those places, is unfaithful to his wife, goes out drinking on Saturday nights. And he's prospering. It's not worth serving God on the straight road. I'm done. Psalm 73. You know what else it says there in Psalm 73, friends? It says, I became embittered. I became embittered. Go and read it. And the very next verse says, I became senseless and a brute beast. These are my senses, my eyes, what I see. My hands, what I touch, my mouth, what I taste, what I say, my ears, what I hear. Those are my senses. When I become bitter, I lose my senses. My senses go wrong. So everybody I see, Zoli looks at Michelle through a different set of eyes, through a different set of ears, because I have embittered her heart. Friends, why are we studying the book of Ruth? Why is this book of Ruth so amazing? Because Naomi arrives back in Bethlehem, she arrives bitter. But she meets a man whose senses are the same as Jesus. He sees like Jesus does. Clint reminded us last week that Boaz took notice of Ruth. He saw her. Just like Jesus did with that rich man. In Mark 10, there's this rich man comes and asks Jesus some questions. And it says Jesus looked at him. And he loved him. He looked at him. And he loved him. Boaz heard about what Ruth had done. Boaz spoke out of his mouth blessing. Boaz kept opening up his hands in giving. And so she came into contact with a man whose senses were redemptive. And she got healed. She got healed. Turn with me to Exodus 15, please. Is this making sense to you today? You're getting it. It's got to be practical. Exodus 15. Look at verse 22. It's on the screen. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. So these guys are thirsty. They're sweaty. I'm sure they're obviously a bit agitated. When they came to Mara, say Mara. Where did we hear that, friends? Where did we hear the name Mara? Yeah, in Ruth. Mara means bitter. 
When they came to Mara, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That's why the place is called Mara, bitterness. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to do? They grumbled. Whenever there's bitterness, there's always grumbling. Have you grumbled this week, friends? Maybe you're bitter. Then Moses cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. Say piece of wood. He threw it into the water and the water became sweet. Thank you, Jesus. God shows Moses a piece of wood. A piece of wood. The cross of Christ, friends, gets thrown into the water of bitterness and that bitter water becomes sweet. God showed Moses a piece of wood. The job of the church, friends, is to show people a piece of wood. And when you see what Jesus did on the cross on that piece of wood, and when we throw that piece of wood into the water, friends, that bitter water becomes sweet. And it doesn't matter if you've become bankrupt, if you've moved your house, if you've learned a new culture. It doesn't matter if you've lost your husband and he's moved overseas. And your children, I'm not being insensitive, friends, because I do know your pain. But when we throw that cross deep into that water of bitterness, that bitter water becomes sweet. And Naomi somehow, through Boaz's life, tasted that water. And she said, how can I, the one who went bankrupt, the one who moved, the one who lost her husband, lost her sons, the one who, she changes from bitter to sweet and says, but ah, how can I help you, Ruth? Find another husband. The local church, friends. When the local church says to people, how can I help you find another husband? If we bitter, we are not going to be able to say to people, but how can I help you? Friends, you've got to throw the cross at your bitterness. I want to say that again. You've got to throw the cross of Jesus Christ at your bitterness. You've got to ask for forgiveness. You've got to repent. And you've got to let the sovereign grace of God touch it. When? Today, friends. We're going to settle the matter today. On this August weekend today, we're going to settle the matter. For time's sake, we're going to look at Genesis 38. You don't have to turn there. But there's a very similar situation in Genesis 38. There's a lady there in Genesis 38. Her name is Tamar. She gets married. Her husband dies. She marries again. Her second husband dies. And then she takes matters into her own hands. She doesn't have somebody like Naomi to help her and point her into a direction. She takes matters into her own hands. She takes off her clothes, her widow's clothes. You see, that picture in Ruth is not a sexual picture of Ruth getting dollied up to go and sleep with Boaz. No. But this picture here with Tamar in Genesis 38 is that she's taking off her widow's clothes and putting on other clothes to say, I'm available again. Tamar, she puts on a new set of clothes, the clothes of a prostitute. And she stands on the side of the road and she ends up sleeping with her father-in-law, Judah. And she sends back a message a few months later to say, to Judah, her father-in-law, I'm pregnant. And some of you know this story. And Judah replies and he says, kill the whore. And friends, from that pregnancy with Tamar and her father-in-law, a little boy is born and his name is called Perez. And if you go back to Ruth chapter 4, let's go there quickly. Turn with me back to Ruth chapter 4. Verse 18, can you see it there? It says, this then is the family line of Perez. There's this little boy. Say Perez. This is the family line of Perez. So Perez is in the family line that becomes Boaz. That becomes Obed. That becomes Jesse. That becomes David. That becomes Jesus. One girl took off her clothes. And she put on prostitute clothes. And then Tamar took off those clothes. And she slept with her father-in-law and another girl, Ruth. She took off her clothes. And she put on another set of clothes, her best clothes. And she kept those clothes on because she dealt with a righteous man. 
named Boaz, a man who had the same senses as Jesus, a righteous man who never took advantage of her. And God uses both of these women in his genealogy of Christ, friends. I want to say to you, friends, it is wonderful when you can get dressed up and put on perfume and present yourselves at the feet of Christ. But if you're naked and ashamed and you've got dirty clothes, then you too can present yourself at the feet of Christ. Why? Because he is a greater Boaz. He's a better Boaz. He's a more powerful Boaz. He's not a middle-aged man snoring in a corner full of wine and full of corn. No, he is a healthy, strong, resurrected Christ. And you can lie down in your dirty clothes. And that man who was at the tomb in Luke chapter 8, he had no clothes on. He was naked. You can come naked. You can come with perfume. You can come with dung on you. And you can lie at the feet of Jesus and he will cover you with his robes. He will cover you with his robes. And I want to be part of a church here with you, friends, that whatever condition you're in, you can come however you like. And when I kneel at the feet of Christ and I say, Jesus, please, will you redeem me every time he places his cloak of righteousness over me? You see, friends, there are three things that Boaz could have done. He could have taken advantage of her sexually. He could have rejected her. And he could have redeemed her. And I want to say to you today, if you've been taken advantage of, if you've been rejected, I want to tell you about the Boaz of heaven. Jesus will always, always redeem you. Let's pray. I pray, mighty God, that specifically today, today matters will be settled today. I pray today, Lord, that we would throw a piece of wood, the glorious old rugged cross of Jesus Christ. We would throw that wood, that cross, into the pools of bitterness. We throw that wood, Lord, into those pools of bitterness. And I pray for your grace. I pray for your favor. I pray we do it today, God. I want to say, if you've got a root of bitterness in your heart, it cannot be managed. It cannot be nursed. It has to be ripped out. And if that's you, then I ask you to stand as we sing this song together. As we surrender at the cross. As we stand in awe of what you've done, Jesus, on that cross. As we leave, as we throw the cross and our bitterness. I pray you pray this prayer with me. Just pray it out loud. Lord Jesus, today, today, I throw a piece of wood, the cross of Jesus Christ, into the pool of Mara. Say it out loud. Into the pool of bitterness. And I ask that you would rip this root out of my heart. Rip it out of my heart, Lord. In Jesus' name. And I ask you, Boaz of heaven, to throw your cloak around me to place your cloak of righteousness over me today and i thank you that you've settled this matter today today in jesus name amen